Well, I can remember that evening, my brother and myself being scuffled off to bed. My sister's on the phone in her room. My dad's already in bed. My mother, she had heart complications and um, she'd forgotten to take her medicine. My mother got up, went into the kitchen, grabbed her medicine. She thought she saw something out the back door, which had a small square window in it. So as she approached it, and she went to flip on the light, she saw some gentlemen stand back against the wall. And at that time, they said, don't panic, we're coming in. Well, what do you do when that happens? So she turned around, she yelled to my dad, get your gun, something's going on. I'm Jed Lipinski. This is Gone South. Episode 2, Junior. The Gypsy Camp and Sherry murders took place nearly 20 years apart in different states. And yet, Kirksey Nix was believed to be directly involved in both of them. He is, without question, the most famous member of the Dixie Mafia. Since the 1960s, when Kirksey was still in his 20s, he has been alternately identified as the group's leader and godfather. Kirksey McCord Nix Jr. is a so-called godfather of the Dixie Mafia. Arraignments are being scheduled now for Louisiana inmate and Dixie Mafia leader Kirksey McCord Nix. Kirksey Nix, the mastermind of the scam. Nix is a key figure in what is most commonly referred to as the Dixie Mafia. According to Darlene Kern's book, The Dixie Mafia, Nix's underworld associates considered him a, quote, psychopathic killer who had participated in at least 16 murders. Kern calls Nix probably as dangerous as any man in America. Whereas most criminals of his caliber kill only for revenge, to escape capture, or for personal reasons, Kern wrote, Nix just kills to kill. Most if not all of the original members of the Dixie Mafia are now dead. Many of them were murdered or died in prison. But Kirksey is still alive. He turned 79 in August of 2022 and has been locked up for the past 50 years. He's currently incarcerated at a federal prison in El Reno, Oklahoma, not far from where he grew up. Last spring, I wrote Kirksey a letter, but I never got a response. Then, months later, I got a call from a guy named Jason Fisher. My name is Jason Fisher. Jason Fisher, okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. And you're a friend of Kirksey's? Yeah, yeah, we're very close. Jason said he'd looked me up online and told me Kirksey was interested in talking. A few days later, I got a call from El Reno Prison. This call is from a federal prison. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, great. How are you? I'm all right. I'm alive. On the phone, Nix denied that he was ever a leader of the Dixie Mafia. He was sentenced to life in prison when he was just 28 years old, he said. And I was a boss of nothing. I was a kid trying to learn everything I could for the older guys. In fact, Nix claimed that the Dixie Mafia was a myth invented by law enforcement. There were no leaders. There were, you know, nobody regulated people because there was no organization, you know. Dixie Mafia was an invention. Kirksey admitted he had done some bad things in his life but he insisted that he'd never killed anyone or played a direct role in any murders. I'm interested in making money. I'm not interested in hurting people. Right. And I never have been. The truth's in my favor if they could ever peel through through the onion. Over the next few months, I spoke with Kirksey almost every day. I want to go over a a few things. When you were arrested at age 29... When we left off, we were talking about Bobby having made those allegations. I also spoke to people who knew him as a young man. And I came to believe that understanding Kirksey Nix is vital to understanding the Dixie Mafia and its role in the deaths of Vince and Margaret Sherry. I'm an outlaw, and I, and I was a, a thief. But I'm far from being the psychotic, psychopathic nutcase that I've been made out to be. Kirksey Nix's upbringing was not what you'd expect of a career criminal. 
Born in 1943, he was raised by major Oklahoma power brokers. All of the adults in his world were bigger than life characters. That's Bo Ann Williams, Kirksey's cousin and a criminal defense attorney in Oklahoma. They were flamboyant and very, very strong personalities that lived big, accomplished big, you know, overachievers. The first to do many things, not just not your normal family. Everything was over the top. His father, Kirksey McCord Nick Sr., was perhaps the best known criminal defense lawyer in Oklahoma history and a legendary performer in the courtroom. He had something like 48 capital murder dispenses and only lost one of them. Wow. That's Billy Kerr, Kirksey's stepbrother. In addition to his legal work, Nick Sr. served in the Oklahoma State Senate and the House of Representatives before becoming chief judge of the Court of Criminal Appeals. Kirksey's mom, Patsy, meanwhile, was a crusading attorney in her own right. I think she graduated from law school in 1941. Female attorneys were supposed to go to law firms and work in the law library for the male attorneys. And I, I, I had an old man tell me this one time that uh, she not only went to the courtroom, she kicked our ass. <laughs> so I guess she was a pretty good attorney. Kirksey's parents divorced when he was a kid and both quickly remarried. His mother's new husband, Bill Kerr, came from one of the wealthiest families in Oklahoma. Kirksey grew up surrounded by elites, but he was also exposed to the underworld. His dad often brought him to prison to meet the men he was defending. He helped some of them make parole or get out or worked on their cases. So I would go out to the prison with him, and they would have belts and scalpers and holsters and toy guns. I didn't know who they were. They were just guys, you know, that knew my dad and gave me things. So I love the place. One of the men he met was Henry Cook Salisbury, a convicted murderer also known as Hatchet Henry. Henry got that name because he'd allegedly killed a man with a hatchet after the man stepped on his hat during a card game. And he was doing time in the Oklahoma penitentiary, but he had a saddle factory in, in the prison. And he used to make me saddles, side saddles, cavalry saddles, Spanish saddles, Western saddles. And I thought he really loved me. Kirksey's parents had high hopes for their son, with good reason. He was definitely the smartest guy around, you know, and he was a natural leader. It was just his personality, you know. He was in control of most groups he was in with his friends. He was the head guy, you know. Still, Kirksey feared he would never match his parents' levels of accomplishment. My parents were grooming me to be a lawyer. I aspired to be like my dad, to be a politician, to be in politics, to be a lawyer. He was so successful and charismatic and could speak so well, because he could make you laugh and cry in, in two, two different sentences. You know, and that was his gift, his oratorical abilities. And so, I, you know, I guess I said I would say I felt insecure. I could never be as good as him. You know? Bowen said Kirksey got lost in the shuffle of his mother and father's big time law careers, TV appearances, and political campaigns. On top of that, his parents created new families with their respective spouses, making Kirksey the odd man out. Bowen remembers him carrying a lot of anger inside. I remember one day Kirk came running into my parents' bedroom and jumped up on their bed and were, was bouncing on it really hard. And I thought, oh, Lord, you know, he's going to get in all kinds of trouble, and my mom's going to be so mad. And when she saw him, she she pulled him down, and she wrapped her arms around him, and she just held him until all of the squirming and jumping was out of him. She just held him tight. I asked her later, you know, I, I'd have gotten killed if I'd acted like that. Why were you so sweet to him? And she said, that poor boy is so angry and he has no place to put it. Kirksey rebelled as a teen. He got in fights, stole parts for his hot rod, and engaged in what Boan described as amateur con artistry. 
I think it was something about using his wits to outsmart, to uh, change the situation around him, to command the attention that he needed. Something like um, beating his own chest. I am not nothing. <laughs> I can take you. I can get you. Kirksey's parents saw what was happening and shipped him off to military school with poor results. He went to uh, Sewanee Military Academy in Tennessee. And he went to New Mexico Military Institute, but it didn't take. <laughs> what do you mean it didn't take? Uh, I think I think he checked himself out early, went AWOL and ran home. <laughs> Kirksey eventually dropped out of high school. And in 1962, at age 19, he got arrested for the first time for theft, though the charges were later dropped. With no clear prospects, he signed up for the Air National Guard and was stationed at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. I tested for, you know, what my abilities were, and, and based on my test results, they wanted me to go to electronic school. And that's what I did, it was microwave radio re relay repairman. That was a, a deal with tubes and wave, wave guides. That's what resulted in me compromising some fairly uh, lucrative alarm systems. <laughs> the Air Force was not for Kirksey, and he left after his electronics program ended. But the city of Biloxi made an impression on him. I, I was there not about nine months, but I fell in love with the area. The antebellum homes, the Spanish moss, the lake, the, the beach, and the drive, and then New Orleans. I made a couple of trips to New Orleans. After Keesler, Kirksey moved in with his grandmother in Eufaula, a small town outside Oklahoma City. He was 20 years old and at a crossroads. But a chance encounter with his cousin Eddie changed his life. He was a, a gambler and a, good with cards, good with dice. He had a new 64 Bonneville. You pressed a button and it poured you a drink. He wore alligator shoes and, you know, and I was duly impressed. Eddie was also a con man schooled in sleight of hand techniques, like how to lay the note, a method of shortchanging cashiers. Kirksey was desperate to learn from him and Eddie was happy to oblige. Eddie was from Dallas. I guess he had some heat down there and he came up to Eufaula and I hear my grandmother say, why, Eddie Earl Faulkner, bless your little old heart, come in this house. And I jumped straight out of bed because I wanted to learn how to lay the note, you know? So he showed me some things about cards and how to lay the note. I took off. When Kirksey's father learned Eddie was hanging around his son, he warned him not to make matters worse. My daddy called Eddie up to the mountain and told him, listen, little Kirksey's got a lot of natural con about him, but he hadn't learned how to use it yet, Eddie. And he's got enough larceny in him that he'll steal a hot stove. And I don't want him learning. And Eddie told him, Judge, if I show him another thing, you can put me under that penitentiary. He said, that's what I'll do, Eddie. Eddie disregarded Kirksey Sr.'s advice. Instead, he treated Kirksey as his protege. Something that we did together in 64, my end was 10700 And a month later, we beat a guy for 40000 And if you'd asked me to be Secretary of State, I'd have told you, go screw yourself. And why's that? What do you mean? I mean, I had, a, I had a new Cadillac convertible and money and car, and I knew how to do certain things and do them successfully. After that, there was no turning back. And so rather than pour water on the fire, he poured gas on the fire. And my dad told my mom, it's over now, and he was right. By the mid-60s, Kirksey was supporting himself as a full-time hustler. He spent a lot of time in pool halls and illegal gambling clubs. He got arrested for carrying illegal weapons, transporting a prostitute, and passing a bogus check. But these and other charges were dropped or thrown out with a paltry fine. Some believe Kirksey's father used his influence to help Kirksey out of trouble. But Kirksey said his dad's notoriety actually made things worse. I was a judge's son getting in trouble. So there was more publicity and more scrutiny on what was being done. He would get his name in the paper on account of me, and I would get my name in the paper on account of him. 
Over time, Kirksey became a regular at the big gambling spots across the South. Biloxi, Phoenix City, Alabama, Newport, Kentucky, and Moffitt, Oklahoma. The more he traveled, the larger his circle of like-minded con men, gamblers, and grifters became. The brothels were a community of criminals and lesbians and gays and social outcasts. It, it was a community all in itself. This is Lorray Sharp. Her mother ran one of several brothels in Fort Smith, Arkansas during the 1960s. It was wild. It was real wild. The Johns would come and go, and the dope dealers would come and go, and the card games would be upstairs and lasting for three days. And a lot of stories about people getting chased after and shot at, and people coming and bringing their cars, and they got bullet holes in the cars and machine guns in the trunk. I mean, it was just, it was like Goodfellas. There was money and drugs and weapons everywhere. The brothel was located off Interstate 40 at the Oklahoma-Arkansas line, making it a convenient spot for Kirksey and his friends to stop when traveling to and from the Deep South. I met Kirksey at the age of 10. He was one of my brother-in-law's criminal running buddies. And they did everything from the grifting lifestyle, robbing houses, you name it, and they, they did it. And it was as though different people had different specialties. They might do a drug deal. You go find the people that got the drug connections. Or if they were going to rob a place of all its furs, they would hijack the trucks. That's their specialty, you know. Lorraine described her circle as a tribe. And while Kirksey was a full-fledged member, he also stood out. Kirksey Nix was kind of a legend because he was so flashy and so bold. Everybody talked about how flamboyant he was. He would show up in a green shark skin suit with green alligator shoes and a gold Cadillac with, you know, a solid gold watch on. It wasn't just his outfits. Kirksey also planned ingenious schemes that made use of the electronic skills he developed at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi. And I remember they were gonna have this big poker game with this very wealthy man, and they put a camera in the ceiling in the light fixture so that they could see anyone's cards. And then they had this little electronic beeper that the guy up there would beep and whoever was at the table had this electronic thing on their leg. And then of course that scores the, the newest legend of Kirksey Nix, you know. That legend was fueled by acts of conspicuous generosity. As a girl, Luray saw Kirksey as the Robin Hood of Southern grifters. He'd be, you know, in and out of town in a flash. You'd never know when you're going to see him. You never know when he's going to be back. But uh, he'd roll into town and scoop everybody up and take them all shopping and spoil the kids and, you know, order 10 times the food that was needed to be eaten and just very godfatherish. But it was almost like it was like he lived to steal so he could give it away. Around 1966, Kirksey moved back to Biloxi on the advice of his friend and sometime running partner, Jimmy James. Kirksey and his new wife, an Oklahoma-born photographer named Sandra Rutherford, found an apartment a block from the beach and a short walk from the strip joints and nightclubs on the strip. By then, Biloxi had become a haven for underworld characters. The Biloxi Sun-Herald would later estimate that more than 100 members of what would soon be called the Dixie Mafia were living in the area drawn by the climate and the culture of vice. Kirksey was happy in Biloxi, but his arrival presaged a dark turn in his criminal career. In 1967, he was implicated in two high-profile murders, one local and one out of state. The more famous of the two occurred in McNary County, Tennessee, and would become the basis for the classic 1974 film, Walking Tall. I got nothing against a little drink, a little fun. But the law of the land shouldn't be for sale. On the morning of August 12th, as Sheriff Buford Pusser and his wife Pauline were driving, four men pulled up beside them and sprayed the car with bullets, killing Pauline and shattering Pusser's jaw. According to historian W.R. Morris, Pusser believed Kirksey Nix was one of the trigger men, but he was never arrested or charged in the killing. The second murder took place four months later in Biloxi, Around 3 a.m. on December 17th, a local bookie and nightclub owner named Harry Bennett was walking home from a poker game 
when he was shot eight times with a 32 caliber pistol. Harry Bennett was found shot to death in front of his Biloxi apartment. Bennett was sent to testify against two other crime figures. Bennett never made it to court. Cops ascribed his death to gangland activities, and they suspected Kirksey was involved. He'd checked out of his apartment two days earlier without paying rent, cops learned, and Bennett was about to turn state's evidence against his friend, Jimmy James. But again, Kirksey was never charged. Kirksey has always denied involvement in the Pusser ambush or the Bennett murder. But if he wasn't involved, why did law enforcement seem convinced that he was? Why did author Darlene Kern, writing a few years later, claim Nix had participated in at least 16 murders? For Kirksey, the answer lies in the invention of the Dixie Mafia. Not long after the Bennett and Pusser murders, a group of lawmen from the Southeast gathered in Dallas to address the problem of what they called traveling criminals. Gene Fields, the New Orleans detective who'd investigated the Gypsy Camp case, remembers the meeting. I think it was somebody out of Tennessee that come up with the name Dixie Mafia and it just kind of stuck. Using the name Dixie Mafia had several benefits. For one, it allowed them to get funding. As Kirksey pointed out, Richard Nixon had recently passed something called the Law Enforcement Assistance Act, which freed up $3 billion for rural, city, and state police departments to fight organized crime. Branding hundreds of loosely affiliated Southern con men, car thieves, safe crackers, bank robbers, and hitmen as a single organized mafia granted cops access to those funds. It also gave police, politicians, and the public a common enemy, something they could stamp out together. They needed to describe this as a mafia and ba 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 to put terror into the community and and get attention. And it, if anything, it was opposite. It was unorganized. There were no leaders. There were, you know, nobody regulated people because there was no organization. <laughs> you know. But according to Kirksey, none of that mattered. The cops knew that calling him a leader would help their cause. I was newsworthy and noteworthy. Different police departments realized if they threw me in it, you know, leader this, that, they were going to get more publicity and then they were going to have a higher need for funding for organized crime. Gee, is that a coincidence? Hmm. In January of 1970, Kirksey was in Georgia State Prison, having pleaded guilty to attempted bribery to avoid facing murder and robbery charges in Louisiana for the gypsy camp heist. Despite being behind bars, cops still accused him of planning a major robbery in Dallas. Newly appointed police chief Frank Dyson has hardly had time to get his administration in office and his battle on crime underway when being hit by what has been described as one of the biggest burglaries in Texas history. On the morning of January 12th, employees of the Lintz Brothers Jewelry Store, three blocks from Dallas Police Headquarters, discovered a giant hole in the wall that it shared with the shoe store next door. Dallas Police still aren't sure when the burglary occurred, although they believe it was sometime Sunday night. They do know the thieves cleaned out the safe and escaped with about 70 trays of gems, one stone valued at $48,000. Dallas detectives estimated the losses at more than $3 million, the equivalent of over $22 million today. The press called it a super-sophisticated job, pulled off by top underworld pros. With no immediate suspects, police focused on the Dixie Mafia and Kirksey Nix, who they surmised had directed the robbery from prison. But here's the thing. When I asked Kirksey about the Lintz burglary, he implied that, in fact, he had been involved. Did you have something to do with that? Did you know about it? Like, what's that? I know about it, you know, and I, I, I know the people. And I'm, I may know a little more than that about it. I got a courtesy play from it. You got a courtesy play from the burglary, from the Lynch burglary? Yeah, yeah. I really don't want to go too much into it because uh, the other people are presumably still alive. But uh, they have been working on the uh, system and they had some of my equipment. In other words, Kirksey denied directing the robbery, but he knew the robbers, they'd used his equipment, and he got paid for the job. So the cops weren't entirely off base when they suspected he was involved. Which leads me to a larger point. Describing a loose-knit group of traveling criminals as a mafia may have been technically inaccurate. 
But as the unsolved murders of Margie George, Harry Bennett, and Buford Pusser's wife indicated, and as the Lintz burglary made clear, local law enforcement was powerless to stop them. The cops needed to do something, and calling Kirksey and his crew the Dixie Mafia was the best idea they had. For law enforcement, the end justified the means. For the time being, though, their strategy had yet to show results. In the summer of 1970, Kirksey Nix was released from prison. Talking with me on the phone, he candidly implied that he'd participated in a major heist in Atlanta just months later. I gave you a date the other day. Did you ever check it out? A date? October 1970. Okay, I'll look. And when you see the paper, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's actually famous in Atlanta. It took me a while, but I finally found the article he was referring to. On October 17, 1970, the front page of the Atlanta Constitution ran a story about an armed robbery at an after-party following the famous Muhammad Ali-Jerry Quarry fight in Atlanta. Eight men in ski masks carrying sawed-off shotguns had burst into the home and dragged hundreds of partygoers into the basement, where they were stripped naked and forced to hand over their cash and jewelry. Atlanta police claimed the take was $200,000, or more than $1.5 million today. The robbers escaped, but the cops did manage to locate a leather bag containing a sawed-off shotgun, three pairs of men's alligator shoes, playing cards, and an assortment of dice. It sounded like things you might find in young Kirksey Nix's bedroom closet. That was just a couple of months after I got out, and uh, nobody wanted to say what the real figures were. You know, people that lost uh, what they lost. I I, I made over $100,000. Kirksey was never charged in the Atlanta robbery. And yet, despite his relative success as a criminal, he showed signs of going straight. Not long after his release, Kirksey and his wife moved to New Orleans and began diversifying their portfolio. Sandra opened a photography studio that catered to clients of a nearby beauty shop. And we were doing a couple a week, and, and she was making anywhere from 1,000 to 1,400 a shop, which was pretty good back then. Kirksey invested in a portable dumpster business. Dempsey dumpster garbage disposal. You know, you drop the canisters off and the trucks pick them up and stuff. He also considered financing a casino resort on the Galapagos Islands and even made two trips to Quito, Ecuador to meet with investors. Uh, You know, I'd been making trips to Ecuador and and I had a pretty significant amount of money. By all appearances, things were going well for Kirksey. But just a few months later, in early 1971, a botched home invasion in New Orleans would turn his life upside down. My dad, Frank Corso, he was an awesome guy. He was real loving, real sweet. Italian, of course, so he had that black curly hair which would be great because every evening when he'd come home, i get to bring him his slippers and comb his hair. I just loved it. This is Sue Corso. She and her six siblings grew up in Gentilly, a neighborhood in New Orleans near Lake Pontchartrain. Her father, Frank, was a successful businessman who owned a string of grocery stores in the city. There was one in New Orleans East, there was one in Metairie, and then there was the one on Chef Highway. And... Uh, he pretty much worked them from morning, noon, and night. They were open seven days a week. He taught me how to run that cash register, probably at about six years old. Put a couple of uh, stacks of wood behind there, stand up by that cash register, learn how to make change, pretty much anything. He'd get the kids involved, and uh, we did learn a lot from him. While they weren't ostentatious with their wealth, the Corsos had plenty of money. I mean, we always had a new home. Every couple of years, they would build a new home. My, my parents always had newer vehicles. We never lacked for anything. On the night before Easter Sunday, Sue's mother, Marion, put Sue and her younger brother to bed early so she could prepare their Easter baskets. My dad's already in bed. My sister's on the phone in her room. My mother, she had forgotten to take her medicine. My mother got up, went into the kitchen, grabbed her medicine. She thought she saw something out the back door, which had a small square window in it. So as she approached it and she went to flip on the light, she saw some gentlemen stand back against the wall. And at that time, they said, don't panic, we're coming in. So she turned around, she yelled to my dad, get your gun, 
something's going on. As she comes down the hallway, my dad meets her coming out the door. He had grabbed the gun from the shelf. So she goes into the bedroom, she shuts the door. That's when the gun battle happens in the hallway. They start firing, he starts firing, and he actually took five into the core of his stomach. Frank shouted to his wife that he'd been shot. Marion ran back out of the bedroom with Sue on her heels. So I follow my mom down the hallway. My mom picks up my dad's gun. I see my dad laying there. You know, it's happening so quick. Sue remembers seeing a man at the end of the hallway holding his stomach as if he'd been shot. I watch my mom point the gun at him, but I look blankly at him and the guy holding him up. My mom fires the two shots. By this time, they're out the doorway. Marion Corso would later testify that, as the wounded man was being carried outside, he raised his gun to shoot her, but no shots were fired. When Marion returned to her husband, she found him in bad shape. The carpet in the hallway was actually red, but my dad's bleeding out so bad, the blood is redder than what the hallway carpet is. She grabs a face cloth, chaos is going on, my sister comes out of the bedroom. Sue's older sister tried to call the police, but the phone lines had been cut. The phone's dead. I can't call. We can't call for help. My mom said, let's go stop a car. So I follow her out to the main street. We're trying to stop cars. Nobody's stopping. My sister hauls off next door. She uses the phone to call the police. When the ambulance finally arrived, medics told Sue to cover her eyes as they wheeled her father out. The next morning, we are called. They said, come to Mercy Hospital. You know, your dad's still alive. You're going to get to see him. So me and my little brother are sitting there. All of a sudden, one of my sisters come down, and she's crying. And he had passed before I got to go see him. And we stay in there and cry. It seemed like we cried for two weeks straight. The night of the murder, Gene Fields, the NOPD detective, was called to the scene. We got people out in the neighborhood canvassing, knocking doors, talking to everybody for witnesses. We had Marion and the kids. We had to get them to a safe place. There was no shortage of evidence. In the backyard, they found a metal hydraulic jack used to force open the back door. On the patio, they found a leather satchel full of burglary tools. And in the gutter across the street, they found a 9 millimeter handgun with an empty shell casing lodged in the chamber. Cops would later conclude that the wounded man had indeed tried to shoot Marion Corso, but the gun jammed. A neighbor reported seeing the robbers load a wounded man into a blue 67 Ford Mustang. So Gene's partner, Detective Fred Williams, started calling local emergency rooms. In addition to checking all the hospitals, we put our teletypes all over for any gunshot wound, anything like that. Fred called all the hospitals locally trying to find if anybody showed up and we found nothing. So Fred decided to call local airports. And then when he checked Lakefront Airport, they learned that it was a plane there and that some people had been there, and male and female, one looked like he was hurt. They were carrying him into the plane and they flew out and they were going to Dallas. So that's when he made the call and Dallas police began checking it. A few hours later, Dallas police called back. And uh, Fred got a call from Dallas, said, hey, we got a guy over here with a gunshot wound. It's Kirk C. Nix. Gene remembered Kirk C. from the Gypsy Camp case. The Dallas cops then explained that they had located the pilot, a Dixie Mafia hanger-on named Travis Butch Stallcup. Stallcup confessed that he'd flown Kirk C. and his friend, Stanley the Creeper Cook, to Dallas in a small single-engine plane. Stallcup said Kirksey was vomiting during the flight and sucking on ice chips his wife had packed into a thermos. Upon landing, Stallcup brought Kirksey to his house, but his wound was too severe, and his friends rushed him to St. Paul's Hospital. So Fred immediately flew over to Dallas to interview him and, and go from there. At St. Paul's, Detective Fred Williams found Kirksey in bed with a gunshot wound in his abdomen. A photo exists of him sitting there. He's only 27, 
but he looks even younger. He's staring flatly at the camera with a hint of a smile, as if he knows he'll get out of this one too. Police wanted the bullet inside Kirksey's stomach for ballistics testing, and they issued a search warrant to remove it. But the medical team refused, saying it would endanger his health. They performed an x-ray instead, which revealed the slug lodged in Kirksey's pelvis was a 32 caliber, the same caliber as Frank Corso's gun. Meanwhile, back in New Orleans, police developed a new lead. We were trying to identify the other people involved, and an FBI agent called us and said they had an informant in Jackson, Mississippi, and he provided the names of Peter Muley, Kirksey Nix, John Fulford, and James Knight as being involved in the robbery. And as a result, we began starting to look for them. The informant provided an address on Encampment Street, a block from New Orleans City Park and a five-minute drive from the Corso home. When we got to the apartment, we found all the blood-soaked clothes and sheets and everything where they had treated uh, Kirksey before they took him off to the airport. And that's where we found Knight and, and, uh, and Fulford. Cops arrested both men. A search of the apartment turned up black ski masks and several firearms. Kirksey's place was down the street, and a witness said she'd seen all four robbers there days before the murder. James Knight, the alleged getaway driver, agreed to cooperate. Based on his grand jury testimony, Kirksey, Fulford, and Muley were indicted on murder and armed robbery charges, to which they pleaded not guilty. When a trial was scheduled, the DA announced he'd be seeking the death penalty. In the lead up to the trial, Kirksey's father joined the defense team. Due to the level of media attention, Kirksey's attorney, Wayne Mancuso, argued he could not receive a fair trial in New Orleans. So the trial was moved 150 miles west to the city of Lafayette in the heart of Cajun country. Sue Corso and her family received round the clock security. When the trial first began, we pretty much have six detectives with us all the time. Sue was only 12 years old at the time, but she has a clear memory of the day she testified. Being young, I'm sure I was nervous, but it's almost like I was prepared for it. I don't know, I felt pretty comfortable about it. And I guess in the back of your mind, you're thinking, ah, pr pretty much like my dad was trying to protect me, I'm trying to, trying to uphold his end of the deal. I remember being shuffled into the witness stand and uh, put my hand on the Bible. One of the questions was, can you point to the people you saw leaving the house that night? It was quite easy. I mean, there they are sitting there right there in front of me. And I pointed them out. I identified Mule and I identified Nix. Marion Corso and getaway driver James Knight corroborated Sue's testimony by putting Kirksey at the scene that night. Knight described Kirksey crawling to the getaway car with a bullet wound in his torso and sitting in bed at Encampment Street before flying to Dallas. He also identified the recovered 9mm as Kirksey's firearm. When Kirksey took the stand, he professed his innocence. He was with his wife the night of the murder, he said, adding that a man named Mike Famiglietti had shot him the next day after an argument over some money. Famiglietti was unable to verify the story. He had been killed the previous summer during a police shootout in Cleveland. As for how he wound up in a Dallas hospital, well, Kirksey's answer was complicated. Famiglietti had shot a man the night before, he explained, perhaps with the same gun. Kirksey worried that if he went to a New Orleans hospital, cops might try to implicate him in the shooting. On the phone with me over 50 years later, Kirksey reiterated that he had nothing to do with the Corso murder. His main defense was that he had no need to break into Corso's home. He and his wife were doing well financially, and besides, he just scored $100,000 in the fight night burglary in Atlanta. The day of the Corso thing, I went and picked up a new 1971 Eldorado convertible for uh, I paid $9,300 for. But my point being, the last thing that I needed to do was be involved in a, in a home invasion, I don't know, eight or ten blocks from my house. And I certainly didn't need to go down the street four deep to get some small amount of jewelry. Kirksey also pointed out his blood was never found at the Corso home. 
but the evidence was overwhelming. At one point, the prosecution presented a map of Corso's neighborhood that police had found under the bed in Kirksey's apartment. A solid black line had been drawn from their address to Corso's home, which was marked with an X. Kirksey would later claim the cops had planted the map, but the all-male jury wasn't swayed. On March 10, 1972, they took just two and a half hours to reach a verdict. The jury comes back in and everybody scuffles back. And then we hear the news. They all were convicted for murder. We're just like crying and, you know, happy in a way, but just so glad to get this behind us forever. When the verdict was read, Kirksey's parents stood by his side and sobbed. A week later, he was sentenced to life and hard labor at the Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola, which had recently been dubbed the bloodiest prison in America. What's worse, in the midst of the trial, his wife Sandra had died tragically in a car accident. Kirksey was devastated. His freewheeling lifestyle, it seemed, had finally come to an end. And yet, there was hope. The jury had denied the prosecution's death penalty request. And under Louisiana law, Kirksey would be eligible for parole after just 10 years. At sentencing, he read a long and eloquent statement outlining the injustices he'd suffered before concluding, we have lost a battle, but not the war. Detective Gene Fields was in the courtroom that day, and he remembers passing Kirksey on his way out. As we left the courtroom, Fred Williams and I were walking out, and uh, Dix was sitting there, and he made some snide remark about, you SOBs can laugh, but we'll be out in six months. I guess he thought they'd pull something, uh, you know, they had connections or they'd get it done. Gene Fields shrugged off the comment. He had no way of knowing Kirksey Nix would find far more success as a criminal behind bars than he had on the outside. Nor could Gene know that nearly 20 years later, law enforcement would put Kirksey at the center of the plot to kill Vince and Margaret Sherry. Next, on Gone South. She was very adamant that she did not want the criminal element that comes along with casinos coming to our city. The saying used to be, if you wanted to get away with murder, do it in Harrison County. He controlled the police department. You know, it's sort of the golden rule. The man with the gold makes the rules. You know, Janis Joplin said, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. If you're not ever going to let me out of prison, what did I have? <laughs> what did I have? Thank you for listening to Gone South, a creation and production of C13 Originals, a Cadence 13 studio. Executive produced by Chris Corcoran, Chief Content Officer and Founding Partner of Cadence 13, along with Jed Lipinski, Tom Lipinski, and Ken Lee. Written and narrated by me, Jed Lipinski. Directed and produced by Lloyd Lockridge. Produced by Tom Lipinski. Edited by Alistair Sherman. Mixed and mastered by Chris Basil. Production support by Ian Mont, Margot Gray, Bill Schultz, Bob Tabador, and Sean Cherry. Original music written and performed by Casey Wayne McAllister. Artwork by Kurt Courtenay. Marketing, PR, sales, and operations and business affairs by Maura Curran, Josefina Francis, Hilary Schuff, Lauren Vieira, Lucas Santroen, Lizzie Roberti, Danny Kutrick, and Karen Andrews. Cadence 13 is an Odyssey company.